Hello everyone, today we talk about foreign intervention in 14th century Italy. We are starting to get a bit more in depth to medieval, into medieval history and at this point observing the, the Italian north, or better centered north, in a, in a crucial century of its history. A very complex, complicated one, right? The 14th century I can't tell you because I'm, you know, I'm specializing exactly in this, and it's considered a mess, like historiographically speaking, because in the 15th century you have a bit more of order, of compaction, even of territorial polities, you know, state building, and so on. The 14th century is a moment of crisis, of contraction, of things that apparently go straight, um, you know, downhill. But at the same time, this instead searches exactly for for the new bases and, and, and building. So we never talked. In fact, up to this point, about uh, this specific time in Italian history, dedicating ourselves probably to, to the 15th century or partly the 13th. I mean, the, the 14th century Italy really is still, as most actually of European realities at this point, to um, still scope historiographically speaking, right? The, it's, history, in a way, is all to write again. Right, not to rewrite completely. Today we talk about essentially an entire century of, of foreign intervention. So you can imagine the, the the utter complication. I mean, from a historiographical point of view, if you search on this stuff, it's plenty. But I mean, plenty of of works, monographies, articles. It's it's enormous, right? And uh, you can hardly dominate it unless you are fundamentally studying it for for decades, right? So we could profitably descend into some detail at some point maybe we do it as far as military history is concerned but here we try more than else to to give a a pattern of interpretation that naturally it's risky from a methodological point of view but um, it's also important to focus on on a reality that as we have seen also from other videos it, it's not truly really, um, popular abroad. Like, uh, there are certain times and spaces in history that are objectively studied more or less, right? The Middle Ages already suffers of scarce consideration, or at least, you know, from in terms of serious historical popular interests, not, you know, revivals or, you know, identity reasons that are not history proper. But we make it um, clear here that this is a uh, a page has been overlooked for a number of reasons, exactly for this idea of decadence, if you want, or contraction, that uh, is a cliche, right? And looking at foreign intervention in the Italian peninsula is a bit realizing that something doesn't fit much in this kind of gloomy picture of, you know, Italy ravaged by the soldiers of fortune and without, without a center, without an order. This is actually, as we've seen already, uh, multiple occasions, um, kind of a m miraculous uh, moment in history where you have basically this cluster, basic 30, 30 city-states that are constantly warring against each other that in a few generations manage to give themselves a, fundamentally a, an order in a regional system that uh, of course is fluid, it's not really even here to be teleologically represented in a just in function of state building. Of course, uh, Italy brought much uh, from that point of view. This is the century of, of humanism and the um, prelude, if not just even here, the start of Renaissance, right? So I it's a moment, a, a deep moment in political, juridical um, theory, in art, uh, in literature, broadly speaking. So it's a moment of actually of, of blossoming of, of great uh, uh, devil. That emerges, however, yes, from a situation of crisis. Crisis meant, in the etymological sense of the word, that is something that is basically um, crumbling apart, but at the same time, not just to remain like that, right? Just to, to change uh, sometimes form and also for the better. And when we speak of foreign intervention here, we definitely pave the road for very deep historiographical reflections in European history because we'll see now what are the dynamics that brought Italy to be 
comparable to foreign intervention. Uh, here it's, it's difficult even to speak of invasions properly meant because, um, as we will see, one major feature, right, uh, of of this moment is is much you know a, a pro an intervention proper backed by local powers, right? These powers had all the interest to throw enemies at each other, but at the same time, the incapability of these um, of these uh, entities were intervening to to actually make a, a long uh, you know to accomplish something durable over time in the peninsula which is something important considering what would happen in the following century the 15th where as we've seen there is the so-called balance of powers that is created by the Italians to maintain to, to keep uh, foreign powers out the thing will fail 1494 with uh, the the beginning uh, with the French invasion that at uh, that point is really an invasion right it also brings to nothing um, on the long run because um, basically it's it's a draw it's uh, a disastrous for both the Italians and the French um, but um, that opens to the to the realization that on, on a much larger scale after a generation more Italy could be invaded and um, way more easily than uh, anybody had thought before apparently even here because as we will see in the 14th century these things had partially already happened but they didn't open to the 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 crisis of the like the one of the wars of Italy right it's also important to consider this period naturally in continuity with the 13th century right and generally speaking the um, the imperial dimension, the Raumfahrt um, of the uh, the Germanic sovereigns that naturally, in order to to become Roman emperors, had to be crowned in Rome, right? And which led to expeditions. We'll start today with Henry the Seventh, that actually arrived in the peninsula forty years after the last Germanic expeditions of Conrad in twelve sixty eight. Um, and that, however, is a pattern there that had already existed in the previous centuries. Um, as we'll see, we also can't um, separate drastically the center and the north of the peninsula that make a somewhat similar wall um, from the south, from the two, at this point, the t actually two kingdoms that are still split between the Angevins and the Aragonese. Uh, and that uh, that are especially, especially Naples, as far as the imperial ambitions were concerned. Actually, the objective of the Germanic expeditions, right? It wasn't much about um, hoping to subdue the north. That um, was, if anything, funding those same expeditions. In a in a way, and of course, seeking even in there for a, you know, the construction of a, let's say, a sphere of influence, a sphere of power. Right, there is an important watershed in, in the 30s and 40s and 14th century when you realize that from the beginning of the century where the Angevins fundamentally from Naples controlled indirectly but consistently and homogeneously great part of North and, and, and Central Italy through various garrisons. Think about the uh, Seneschalc of Piedmont. Uh, this in conjunction naturally with Provence that was just next door but fundamentally having recompacted the situation politically well, we have the situation overthrown, right? We have from the mid 14th century, the Kingdom of Naples that enters into uh, civil strife. Uh, there's even an Hungarian invasion uh, for dynastic reasons because the, the Angevins were on the Hungarian throne as well. Uh, so this thing engulfs, and m there is properly also with the, the crisis of the mid 14th century, the collapse of Neapolitan power, right? The Neapolitan kingdom had uh, was the most powerful of, of the two southern ones, and it it was a better structured one that had inherited more the Norman and Swabian legacy of centralization. At this point, the system, had, especially as far as uh, Robert of Anjou had ruled, um, had held, right? But there is a, a massive structural collapse that uh, it's, inter it's something I've studied myself at some point, um, and that is a very profitable area of research for that matter. I'm actually not an expert on it in the Neapolitan Kingdom, but um, for exactly because studying, actually I've been studying this this phase, um, this part, especially the expedition of Henry VII and so on, 
And there is the sense of defeatism, the idea that these expeditions were somewhat doomed to fail. But the reality is, as we'll see now, that they actually had a, an important effort. The Napoleon Kingdom, however, contra at, at, towards the, the 14th century, all powers here, right, Europe-wide, Europe contract, in a sense. And this naturally boosts the emergence of those dynamic uh, sceneries and other uh, republics of the center and the north that will make them autonomous uh, in, in the following century, in the, yeah, in the 14th and 15th century. Um, but at the same time, we see... Um, even here, uh, a dependency increasing on foreign powers. That is to say, uh, here there is also fluidification of the Ghibelline wealth dichotomy, right? It's not true that Ghibellines allied just with him. I mean, it's a very switching thing. I mean, the, the, the Milanese are allies with the French now, but also the French attacked them at some, at some point. Um, everybody was, it, it was a fluid situation, and this the, actually, in many ways, was the tip of the balance. Right at this point, is actually losing uh, gradually, very gradually during the 14th century. It will be more evident in the 15th uh, terrain, in, in, in as much as you know this big medieval civilization that arrives to the 13th century, at uh, the end of the 13th century, at its peak, let's say, had greatly favored Italy. Right, one fourth of Europeans were Italian. They did what was. Um, you know, they, they had, the, 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 as we've seen, the greatest uh, per capita wealth that would maintain for centuries. Um, and um, these communities were simply building sim things that other states even just had never seen, right? Not just in terms of actual policy, administration, but even military speaking. It's very overlooked. Uh, very few people care because they don't think that, you know, a city state could have, uh, an army could actually uh, equal in, in, uh, in quantity and quality to one of a of a kingdom, but so it is. As a matter of fact, if you study the, the La Scala, for example, or the Visconti, you will find substantially same for. But even Florence, that is stereotypically because of Machiavelli and this kind of um, you know dichotomic attitude that we have, thinking that Florence was always about merchants and no war. It's a myth. This has been Jones studied this. Um, the, the there has been um, there's been a reevaluation of this history because Anglo-Saxon Anglo-Saxon historiography actually looked into this and realized that things are more complicated. Uh, Italian historiography has bear, is starting just now to approach also military terms the 14th century. Uh, it's not that it's, this has not been studied before, but it's been a bit kind of a stereotypical thing of the you know of the foreign uh, mercenaries that ravage everything, and uh, there is no bigger gang. It, it's actually very different, right? The Italians, first of all, were the first responsible for these things happening because they were the same ones who were hiring these people, and um, and using them to profit, right? And the idea of lack of control here is also being inflated. Uh, it's not true, right? If they were lacking control of these units, it's because they were backed consistently by other Italian powers, one against the other. So today we don't specifically talk about that, but we observe specifically the from both sides, I would say, because this is useful. You can't detach Italy in all its uniqueness from the rest of European developments, because um, these powers were constantly... Um, you know, overlapping in terms of spheres of influence, of interests, um, alliances, and so on. So, even in the moment of contraction in European civilization, you see that actually the the, the over the international ties increase. This is an important political uh, datum because it shows you how um, it's it's how these these societies were um, ever more in need of balancing with all means possible. That's what crisis actually brings to the development of something else. So here there are huge, huge uh, historiographical topics to cover. Today we can't fundamentally do it. But let's start with, however, this, this foreign aspect. So uh, we will explain also better some things now. So when we speak of Henry VII intervention in Italy, we mostly, historiography mostly says, oh, it was a failure, right? You know what is, how a story went. The emperor invaded Italy in 1311. He died eventually in, in 1313. What happened in the meanwhile was quite fascinating because he first, um, you know, that Henry was fundamentally uh, a French speaker, 
right? Even until Holy Roman Emperor, the, the Luxembourgs were, you know, Francophones. They, they would eventually seize, at this point, the, the, the Bohemian throne, so that actually John of Bohemia was Henry's son, so as much as Charles the, the Fourth was John's son. So there is a continuity also, very interesting, with the Luxembourgs um, in, in the Italian relations that would last for throughout all, actually, the 14th century. So it enters Italy from the north, from the Susa Valley, uh, that tells you how it was also a kind of a, you know, it wasn't the, the usual Brenner route, where it wasn't kind of a specifically German thing, it was more or less a kind of a Burgundian in, in the sense how they called it at the time, actually, in the same peninsula. Uh, there were many Germans, actually, but also many French, uh, and this thing in between, Flemish even. Uh, it was a very fascinating expedition, at, at some point we can, we make we can make a military history of it because I actually studied it step by step, and um, it's very, very fascinating. It was a yeah. I mean, the here historiography today is concentrating mostly on the political uh, and administrative understanding that Harry uh, had of actually the Italian communes, right? Because Harry's been portrayed um, wrongly, even by somewhat recent biographies as the dreamer, right? Uh, this, bit, this myth that goes on since the orange stuff, I mean the fact that they didn't, they wouldn't have had to invade Italy, that it was all doomed to fail, and this is bullshit, right? Uh, these people knew pretty damn well what was uh, the thing was worth, and they accomplished a big deal, because what happened actually when in the first year of Harry's passage in, in, the, in the Po Valley was the compaction of the area under Ghibelline, that is pro-imperial uh, rule, right? The Visconti and the Della Scala actually rise at this point to the lordships that it would have become, also with a regional uh, ambition, uh, thanks to Henry, right? That appoints them, uh, uh, Matteo Visconti and Cangrande Della Scala, as we will see in a while, uh, some of greatest uh, politicians, also men of war uh, of, of the era, as imperial vicaries. This thing of the vicariate, also there's a beautiful bibliog uh, bibliography about it, um, that it was, it was uh, also in here quite a, um, was a mean of legitimization for the local lords, and it was countered, let's say, by the, the apostolic vicariates, right, of, of Italy, because here technically the, the papacy was naturally Oppose it, the papacy was allied with with the Angevins, with Naples, Provence, and France, broadly speaking. Um, so what Henry does is, you, you know, he first for the first time, right after the defeat of the of the Swabians at uh, Tagliacozzo, he's he's coming after forty years essentially of of Angevin dominance to compact a freaking huge, advanced, rich region, and powerful region as the Po Valley under imperial rule, right? Or better, Ghibelline rule by imperial delegation. Uh, naturally, there were attritions. Things didn't go smoothly. There is the, the siege of Brescia. It was a freaking nightmare. It was an epidemic stare. Uh, the same emperor's brother was... Uh, he was still not emperor, king of the Romans, though, because he hadn't reached Rome yet. Um, died because of crossbow bolt. Uh, he eventually, Henry passes... In in uh, in central Italy, uh, he cross he yeah I mean he cross he, he arrives uh, in Pisa that was also was a bit of more detached of a kind of a maritime republic with terrestrial ambitions but fundamentally Ghibelline and he reaches Rome when he's crowned and there is a fierce clash uh, in the city between uh, the the Imperials the Colonnades and um, the the Angevins and the uh, the, the, or seen the, I mean, the, old, the wealth coalition. Um, it was a massive battle, one, one of the greatest urban battles, uh, and actually the largest, I think, in medieval Rome. The king, uh, the the king of the Romans is crowned emperor of the Romans, but he cannot hold the city, and he launches in thirteen. Um, uh, 12, this expedition against Florence, that was at the time after Naples, basically the major wealth power in Italy, was, uh, had been booming since in last decades, was warring even more than Milan by scale, right? It was a, a few 
actually realized this or this thing they were comparable so meaning that also the, the, the Milanese scenery at this point is taking over after the uh, overthrown of the Guelph uh, de la Torre that Henry had thrown out of the city fundamentally um, and this Guelph Republic of merchants you know of the priori right uh, government uh, is is actually spending for war and incredibly Incredible, incredible lot. There is a, a Guelph League here that is operating in Central Italy. It's many cities together. There is also some some powers of Paul Valley, such as Bologna, for example, that is Guelph. Consider in here that the Papal States, as we were saying before, are um, the 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 papacy is, is fundamentally has already shifted towards uh, here the 14th century. There's the, the period of the Avignonese. Rule, right, so the popes gone in, in Provence fundamentally, um, and uh, the papal states are, let's say, declining in terms of, um, especially s s talking specifically with central Italian lands, in, ter in terms of compaction of rule, right? Not much because they are they're drifting away from papal control, fr from a I mean, in terms of international. Uh, side, you know, they're Guelph, right? There is Perugia in the heart of the Apennines that maintained this fanatically black Guelph, um, you know, you know, policy so that they can also they can also expand on the surrounding cities. Bologna is fundamentally Guelph, um, and that's a recent acquisition because basically, um, the in in 1274. Um, Rudolf of Habsburg that concluded the 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 German interregnum. Um, had essentially seized his crown as king of the Romans. He wouldn't be crowned emperor because he never came to Italy proper. Um, but it, uh, in exchange for these territories um, in the northeast of Italy that, that, that were contended by the Pope since the time of, of Charlemagne with the Empire. So the, the Church naturally has a massive power at this point because they're backed by the French, the Angevins, um, they, they they are booming in terms of administration, they, they, they spend a, an astonishing amount of money in war as well, right, throughout all this because the Guelph League here is is naturally harassing Henry VII. Henry arrives with an army of thousands of, of, of knights, right, and uh, they, they start deserting them after a while, basically at the end of the campaign, they, they were almost uh, all Italians at that point, but they were kind of half and half, uh, so all the Gipolines that were flowing under his command. And he besieges Florence itself, but if the, the siege fails, because it, Florence is able to put together a, an enormous amount of troops, where there are sort of speak of tens of thousands of, uh, actually of 60,000. Um, German sources exaggerate, say even more, but like say infantry and thousands of of knights. Basically, they have a larger army within the city than than Harry's one that is besieging, right? And then he he throws there is in the winter all this guerrilla in 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 the Tuscan countryside, and uh, the 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 imperial army is worn out. He goes back to Pisa, and in third in the in spring he uh, he has put up another army, right, with his Italian contribution, and he's marching, where? Straight to Naples, and the story is that uh, Henry gets uh, sick, uh, contracts malaria, and dies, famously enough, um, in Tuscan itself, and, but sources say that at that point, the Angevins in Naples actually wouldn't have the means to stop the emperor, right, so, after this, now we can't digress too much, but basically the imperial veterans are hired by Pisa that puts up this astonishing effort against Florence, m achieves this mass victory in 1315 at Montecatini against the Florentines and the Angevins. The, uh, the, the, the part of the Neapolitan royalty dies there, the descendants of Charles of Anjou. Uh, it's, it's, it's bad, right? It, it's, it's one of the most intense uh, military, uh, you know, s sequence of events in, in medieval history, right? It, it, it's something astonishing, the sheer amount of, 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 of wealth spent, of men, of the strike, it's, it's, it's incredible. That's why nobody studies this, it's disgusting, actually, because you look at other countries, they, they didn't do this, right? There's not this intensity of, by sheer quantity, 
um, of troops and and and, uh, and money involved on a regular base by all these powers together, right? The, the whole peninsula here is in turmoil, but Henry actually accomplishes this important thing that fundamentally won't be unhinged in the during the rest of the century of compacting the uh, the north under essentially Ghibelline powers. It would never be as completely Ghibelline, so there's always some Guelph power that pops up there because the papacy is freaking out, naturally. And there are further Germanic interventions, but however smaller influence that are basically like kind of a mercenary army hired by the same Ghibellines in Italy to go against other Guelph powers. Uh, it's dramatically complicated, and I know it sounds confusing when you if you hear it for the first time, but actually it, it has a logic. and I, It is coherent, and that's why the broader idea of decline, all this is of lack of control, is not true, as a matter of fact, from all sides. So everything should go in detail. But Henry could even march on Naples, and this is what we don't understand. We must say, ah, it was all like didn't have the power. He had the power, right? The the whole deal here, if you look at the letters that that Henry wrote himself to uh, to the pope, uh, yeah, to the pope, and to to the Neapolitans actually. Uh, he wa he wanted to resist the Neapolitan kingdom, right? The major the reason was not the sending in Italy wasn't kind of subduing the Italic kingdom, center of the north. Um, he wanted to seize the Roman and imperial crown, but then to regain Sicily, that is Naples, basically, uh, Sicily proper is Aragonese, but they, they were still called kingdoms of Sicily in both sides because they wanted to, to recall the, the legacy of the, the Sicilian kingdom. It was uh, one thing, the Swabian legacy, the imperial legacy. Right, that was controversial from a legal point of view because technically that was a papal fief and it's just the Hohenstaufen that tried to force bit the terms there. But um, Conradin had been killed by Charles of Anjou in um, 1269, um, exactly to cut off, you know, the, the you know the inheritance uh, demands of you know of of the of the dynasty. Uh, on the Neapolitan throne, and now Henry VII was saying, as an emperor, you have to to these rebels. The, he he actually says that the the, the Angevins were rebels of the empire, and that he just wanted to kill their dynast, uh, Robert at that time, and, and, and reseize the Sicilian inheritance. Right, and that is powerful because if you look at still at this early 14th century Italy, it was the the the, the struggle between Guelphs and Ghibellines, ideologically speaking, was very hard. Right, it's a proof of this naturally, an anachronist, albeit a genius, naturally in in in, in uh, you know uh, human civilization, literature, history. I mean, like uh, Dante, that uh, was uh, a follower of Henry the Seventh. Right, Dante had been uh, exiled. Uh, by the essentially the, the pro Angevin party in Florence, and he had joined the Ghibellines because the white Guelphs he belonged to were f were were not like the idea mediated that the white Guelphs were just Guelphs, but a bit more modern. No, they were Ghibellines, right? There is no doubt of this uh, of sort and by by terminology. If you ever listen to someone telling you the opposite, just know that they don't know what they're talking about. They were Ghibellines. Uh, Dante went uh, to um, you know to to be eventually as a client of uh, Can Grande in Verona a, that was imperial vicar of Italy at that point uh, he followed the same Henry he um, he advised him he um, also um, he joined Ghibellines and other whites in guerrilla in Tuscany against uh, Florence uh, it's um, you know it, it's what you don't expect I mean you even hear this picture of Dante in you know, a kind of a humanistic sense as the writer poet Dante was a was a was a was a, a knight basically. He was a uh, he came from a moneylender family. He was a diplomat. He was a politician. He was just a poet, and he would have not been the poet he was. Was wasn't just a poet, by the way. He also wrote extensive treatises and so on. Uh, but he if he hadn't been all these things, right? Um, and that's where the game, the mechanism here, all comes from. Right, Dante made of Henry the Seventh kind of uh, the the romantic guy that eventually died, and ah, uh, we all cry now about this. He was right in part, but also he has given the impression of an ill-fated, um, 
yeah, I mean, not Dante maybe in itself, but he's, you know, for those who had interpreted the history of it as, you know, yeah, he was doomed to fail, he, he should have not come in the first place, and now the, the empire was over. This is not true, right? This is not true, because if you see what happened in Italy after that, it's that the Angevins basically lost it in the end. Uh, we see that by the mid-14th century, the, the, the Angevin power in Piedmont evaporated. Uh, as we've seen, the, the kingdom goes in, in uh, civil strife. Um, the same Guelph powers in Italy emancipate themselves, even just as a source of mercenaries. Take Florence, it was the one that usually called the Angevins for help when they were defeated in 1315, 1325. Then they start hiring mercenaries on their own. They start even hiring French noblemen from, from France itself, Germans, that by that time were still seen as mostly, you know, Germans are hired by the Ghibellines because that's more an imperial thing. And uh, there are a lot of interesting ideologies there also among these men. Um, and the French more like for, for the wealth powers. But even if the, the situation gets blended dramatically. Uh, so we don't digress on how things evolved because actually the strategical pattern here there is fascinating. It was it's, it's fascinating to see how major battlefields kind of shifted along the peninsula to, to, to the balance of what political and strategical balance was created. But the question of all these interventions we will see now is why Italy? Well, we've we've seen it many times. Italy is rich, um, strategically relevant, uh, and it's political divide. Uh, politically divided. So this means, of course, that it's the best target for everybody at that point. Um, there are naturally more strictly political meanings. I mean, of course, the Roman coronation. So you can't have properly the imperial title if you don't come to Rome. And you have to get through from the north and you have to cross these the communal uh, powers and that, that's the deal. Um, we find in, in the 14th century, after Henry VII, other important figures that entered personally in, in the peninsula. Here we could, could quote a lot, right? You, there is, for example, the comital, the Flemish comital dynasty, the Dampierre, that fight in Italy time after time, since the time of Benevento, uh, with Charles of Anjou. Uh, uh, throughout all the, the the imperial expedition, I mean, it's uh, of Henry the Seventh. It's it's like the whole family is involved there. What do the Flemish counts do in their life? They go to fight in, in Italy, right? We have to get acquainted to this, to this range of interests, of interactions, of 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 common, uh, of common goals fundamentally between these areas of Europe, because it's not a, a, a foreign invasion. It's these people have, like. There are parties here that, back you know, back are backed by the from from the outside and fight against each other. So, it's always a matter of internal interest towards the peninsula. Um, Ludwig the Bavarian, Louis the the, the fort of Bavaria, Wittelsbach, uh, he also launches this important, um, let's say. Yeah, it was a smaller expedition than one of Henry VII, but it gained steam in the peninsula. He was more shrewd in a, in a way. He just seized the imperial crown. He ransomed. He even here the, the, the relation with the Ghibellines, because technically it's, this is always theoretically the German sovereign, so there's always Ghibelline friendly in theory. Well, he basically kidnaps Milan, and, you know, and and uh, it buys it back, you know, it, uh, with. You know, is both ba that is both back by uh, the Milanese. He starts eventually uh, when he comes back to Germany to, to besiege the same land, but doesn't succeed and goes back north of the Alps. But he ravages here and there. He makes a lot of money, comes back to to Bavaria, and he keeps interfering with Italy. By the way, interestingly enough, because he was the emperor, of course, but also because there were important connections with him and and the the Italian power, especially ones of the north. Um, in, in important moments, there were also there was, for example, the crumbling of the De La Scala Signory, at least territorially speaking. I don't know if today we talk about that, but that's an important war. I mean, Venice and Florence for the first time ally. That would be um, a kind of a constant there. Eventually, the main threat would be Milan, but um, it, it's um, it's an important step forward. Also, considering the the armies they put together uh, to to fight in the Venetian area. 
um, against the La Scala that are completely now uh, mercenary uh, in German. By the way, here Germans were pouring like crazy in the peninsula since the the time of Henry the Seventh. Like before, of course, there had always been German mercenaries, French mercenaries, the Catalans, as well, because the Aragonese in here were 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 Ghibelline in in the broader picture. But after Henry the Seventh, not just there are these veterans that come from imperial lands, but they the incre an increasing amount of them. There are thousands of German mercenaries constantly in Italy, so much that even uh, these imperial interventions in the peninsula are aimed at gaining consensus among these men because they were they were German, right? They were technically, you know, feeling, you know, th these were sometimes noble men, right? Uh, here there is technically all the crisis of the ministeriales and the fact that they went finding fight, uh, you know, to job in Italy as, as military man. Um, but it, it's more complex. There are there are important there are parties even within the same imperial armies in here, right? Some uh, famously, the Cerullo Company was was uh, part of German mercenaries that rebelled against Ludwig the Bavarian and remained in Lucca and seized the city and eventually sold it to the highest bidder. Um, and the um, for for internal imperial reasons, even reasons of papal policy, right? There was a there wasn't a univocal um, uh, trend. Usually, the Swabian these were mostly Swabians and especially Rhinelanders. That, by the way, they, they hated each other guts, and part of the reason why they actually split sometimes like that with mutinies were constant. So it's a freaking mess, but it still has a logic. Uh, there is important. Uh, Expedition uh, intervention, let's say better, uh, like Frederick of Habsburg. That, by the way, was Saint Louis' um, cousin. They had the same grandfather, Rudolf of Habsburg. By the way, who, um, I mean, Frederick. Also, uh, was uh, you know the the Habsburgs now had conquered great part of southeastern Germany, and they were interfering with Tyrol. With Trent, so these areas along the Alps that connected the southern east, southeastern Germany with Italy, importantly enough, and also intervening in northeastern Italy, if, if through some usually through, through some you know some some vassals, um, the the Corinthian uh, uh, the Corinthians were usually sent there. There were even troops from Hungary, from the Banat, Croatia, Bosnia, etc. That are that intervene in northeastern Italy to keep at bay, paradoxically, the same Ghibelline expansion over a city like Padua. That at that point could ask for help for the emperor and to to receive German vicars. By the way, made a mess, and uh, at the end they were overthrown by the da Carrara that were at the end of the day uh, also a, a della Scala creation. Uh, but the Austrians are interested in the area naturally; and it will always remain. Uh, Congrande married into the the Habsburgs. Um, you know that that's interesting. Congrande's family um, had these important ties. Were fanatically Ghibellines, right? But they knew also to how to unseat their wars when you know the, the imperial pressure was too high in the area. But this Caligar power there is fascinating to start. Then we have actually John of Bohemia that is overlooked a bit um, because he entered like just an adventurer. Right, he he was freaking king of Bohemia, but instead of being king of Bohemia, he went around Europe from Lithuania to Italy, from from Germany to 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 France to fight as a knight errant. Right, and he enters Italy. Naturally, he had his reasons too, uh, with just a very few troops. And he, you know, it's almost a fairy tale like s a story that he manages to carve for a for for a brief time, some years. Uh, kind of a lordship in the Paul Ballet because these local Italian powers wanted essentially somebody who would pacify the the area, right? Technically, all these imperial interventions were aimed at this, right? The idea that these were the emperors after all, they were the, the universal authority. So who's better to to put a stop to wars? Because here wars were continuous, like it was an enormous strain. These powers had also to maintain their um, their their stability in a way. So let let's find the pacifier, right? Naturally, there were much um, darker reasons from both sides because naturally you create this lordship, yes, and this and John of Bohemia even 
basically starts siding with with with, with the Papas at some point, um, even though he was the keeper. So it's that messed up, right? To to create a, a senior in the pop bar. Like when the Italians realized that they, they, they are, the the powers to overthrow them, and end of the story. But that's uh, when the also the young, in, say future Charles the Fourth, uh, would of Bohemia, right? Um, Emperor would uh, follow his father and fight in Italy. He won a, a great battle at uh, San Felice and and starts understanding these powers, starts understanding what, what it's said about. And in fact, in his future, you know, his imperial time, when he became king uh, himself after his father died at Crecy, famously enough, when he was blind, but he still wanted to fight until he was, uh, where died also other people that had been in Italy. Here it's all connected, right? Some of the greatest commanders, like Castruccio Castracani, for example, had been favorites of Edward II of England. They had fought in Flanders during the Flemish Rebellion against France. Even as infantrymen who basically managed to defeat the same victorious Flemish uh, infantry of Courtrai. Um, this is fascinating because... I don't know, the Genoese were the French admirals against, uh, think about the Battle of Zierkse, right? So th there is a, a massive Italian connection, right? All the bankers, we've, uh, some of the greatest chroniclers of the time, Villani, for example, was a, was a merchant involved into, you know, also the, the major banking net that f founded England, France. Um, so we're, we're talking about the deep European scale of this. Um, um, uh, Gautier de Brienne, that was son of the, uh, the Duke of Brienne that had been killed at uh, Cephisus by the Catalans, was Lord of, of, of Florence at this time. He went, he died also at Crecy. Um, there are lots of people who come and go in here and that maintain these ties with Italy. In the later period, here we exceed the 14th century, but uh, Robert of Bavaria, Count of uh, the Palatinate, uh, between 400 and 410, and Sigismund of Luxembourg, 410 and 36, example, uh, are uh, names worth, worth the mention as, uh, say, those who intervene in Italy. And this tells you how, cons you know, even just take it from a biological, chronological point of view. I mean, these were the same people. There was a connection uh, over the years between people who had experienced what the, the situation in the peninsula was like. There were naturally also other powers that can be partially considered foreign in the sense that John XXII, for example, Pope between 1316 and 1334, who was French, um, and um, we're talking about the Avignonese papacy that wasn't at all like a French creation, as it's often said. The, the papacy was not captive uh, there. It was actually a, a broader cooperation between papacy and France. At that point, it was uh, unavoidable um, in political perspective. I mean, think about at the beginning of the 14th century, Philip IV of France and Pope Boniface VIII that fight against each other for... You know, we had to be the head of Christianity, but still, they are still allies against the, the, the. I mean, they literally fight against each other, right? Think about Ananya, the battle. You know, the, the Pope was allegedly even slapped by the, by by the colonies and uh, accompanied, accompanied by Philippe de Nogaret, great counselor of Philip IV. Uh, but still, nobody at that time. You know, if there there were an open warfare against each other. Would even say that the Papas in France would not go at war. Uh, against the next Ghibelline threat, right? So that's how multi-layered politically the situation is, and that makes you understand how difficult it is to even speak in, in simple terms about this. But Pope John XXII is consistently the Pope that invests uh, the, the greatest amount of money in the attempt of creating a lordship in the Pope Valley by uh, a papal lordship, literally, or better, by the hand of uh, the Papal legate Bertrand de Puget, that would eventually seize Bologna and control all of it, and um, to knock out the Visconti, though. So there was an attempt basically to restore the Papal Angevin control on the area. The thing fails because the Visconti managed, by the way, also thanks to the, the German mercenaries, to, to, to defeat the Papacy. Milan was about to fall, actually. 
Daddy's Ward the Mansion as well. Um, and po Pope John, uh, John XXII was mostly against uh, Louis the the Fort, uh, the Fort in this picture. Um, and in 1317, he uh, assumed himself as a pope. In fact, the uh, Bacazio Imperi in the Kingdom of Italy. That is to say, he naturally had excommunicated Ludwig the Bavarian, and he mm, assumed this imperial prerogative that was essentially what also, as we've seen, what the papacy had been claiming. It was literally, at this point, as if the, the papacy controlled de facto the, the land as, as the emperors did. Right. And the as that's what we were saying about the by the imperial and papal bickeries and how they worked fundamentally. There are here certain Ghibelline powers were um war is over in the area at some point intermittently that even by the imper the the papal bickeriate because they they wanna rule I mean it's just a, a tool of confirming of confirming and of reinforcing their their local control so this all is is a bit the the game and in all this naturally aside from the spiritual weapons that were definitely uh, impacting from a political point of view there was a military support of of the Neapolitan kingdom under King Robert that in all this is being also um, unfairly criticized for having allegedly been kind of tight-fisted, not having spent enough to back the uh, the Guelph fort in Italy proper. But if you actually look at the Neapolitan military history at this point, the Angevins were launching with a, a dramatic frequency, massive, that is, some of the largest armies you can find in Europe at the time. You, we're talking about two, three thousand knights and multiple tens of thousands of, of infantrymen against Sicily. And if you to take it away from the Aragonese. These expeditions failed all, right? Maybe they, they managed to conquer a coastal fortress and they, they they were enormous, were continuous. So it was a miracle the kingdom at that point even made it, right? You know that after the Vespers, basically the... Uh, it, yeah, it made sense, strategically speaking, to try to reacquire Sicily, right? doesn't matter how messed up it had fallen at that point after the Vespers and, uh, you know, how the Aragonese were not that great at that point, the, the great control. So, because the, the, this was a, mo more like an Aragonese dependency, right? It was still the same Aragonese dynasty ruling there, but sometimes they, they even had, you know, Sicily and Aragon had opposed interests. By the way, the, Aragons, um, the Aragonese actually conquered Sardinia in, in the 20s of, from Pisa at that point. So they surely consolidate an important power, and um, that makes you realize how the Angevins were pressed and how they actually spent some of, up to the last, right? It, it said how when King Robert died, you know, the the, the kingdom collapsed in, internally, and and that is the measure, in my opinion, of this continuous military effort. So some criticize say, ah, oh, you know, King Robert didn't send troops anymore to to the Seneschalk of Piedmont so that the Visconti took over, right? Yeah, but, you know, do you have a, nice, a scale of an idea of what Piedmont could be in comparison to Sicily and the, the, the possibility of seizing it, right? And in all this, of course, power, you know, when somebody became too strong, the other side strengthened again to counter, and, and, and vice versa. It was like this back and forth. Uh, the Habsburgs in this kind of failed in their imperial aspirations. Frederick uh, the Fair was actually defeated and captured in battle um, by his cousin Ludwig the Bavarian. That was an important um, turn. The Habsburgs were kind of unlucky. At this point they, they split also into two branches that would prevent up to the second half of the 15th century to, to reunite their power um, in, in, their, in their possessions. Um, and they didn't make much of a headway in the peninsula. On January the 26th, uh, 1363, Rudolf IV of Habsburg, however, managed to um, succeed to the Tyrol and also to get the uh, hereditary advocacy of the, of the Episcopal sees of, of um, Bressanone, Brixen, and Trent. This is important because these were mm, 
in fact ecclesiastical principalities uh, they couldn't be um, touched so easily. In fact, also it was a problem for the, the La Scala that would have gladly expanded probably in that direction if they had could. But it, they, they were, but you know, cut out of the 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 ups were played it cleverly at the dynastic level there. Um, this, the, especially the acquisition of uh, the uh, Chancery of Trent, brought the Habsburgs to acquire the temporal. Um, the bishop's temporal jurisdiction in the Trentino area, right? These were important for the passes between Germany and Italy, so it had a, a great strategic and economic significance. Consider that at this point, especially from the mid 14th century, from the 30s, um, the mm, the trade route between Venice and Bavaria was was strengthening, right? The Central European route that um, you know when the Hundred Years War broke out in France, the kind of um, the the usual Tuscan Provencal mm, route was cut off, and the Genoese opened the Atlantic one to reach England and Flanders, and the Venetians basically built the one also on, by road with Germany. So hence you understand also the proximity of political interests between these powers, aside from just the geographical, you know, evidence for this dynamics. Um, there was the idea also that these powers would intervene as protectors fundamentally. As we've seen, they, they mostly vested themselves as, you know, our imperial authorities, even when they were actually clashing one against the other because the Habsburgs na naturally never gave up their imperial. I mean, Germany was arguably even more messy than Italy at this point. And they naturally, they were always conflicting. There were emperors were elected from one side of the electors others from others so it was continuous warfare even in there and they they played this double thread in, in the peninsula as well for example in 1319 the northeastern cities of Treviso and Padua recognized the overlordship of Frederick of Habsburg to thwart the territorial ambitions of Cangrande the, uh, the first of the La Scala it was the lord of Verona um, it is fascinating because these cities literally collapsed under the Scaliger offensives. So they didn't have any... It's a strictly military problem. It's not that they called them for no reason. They, when you look at these dynamics, it's just because there was a war that was being fought. Somebody lost and called these protectors. And these guys came as overlords with mercenaries, began to rule there, um, to eventually not accomplish much but just looting the, the cities. And then, you know to be overthrown and why. So actually the having studied these things from, from the detail, the perspective, it makes you realize that there was um uh, you know that these powers weren't even even conjecturing kind of extending their power there uh, in on a permanent base. We're just seizing that opportunity because who knows what will happen in the future. Literally that was a a level of of course of a political unpredictability here that it doesn't matter how simpler societies were compared to now, but uh, if you look at the instability there, it was a freaking mess, right? Changes of regime every freaking second. So, um, John of Bohemia, we mentioned before, entered in Italy in December 3030, initially in, in alliance with Louis IV. Uh, it's, it's fascinating also how Italian policy here is connected to Bohemia, Poland, um, all the... Germany naturally, but specifically all these connections that the Luxembourgs now that had been kind of exported in in Bohemia now began to to have across this this broader Central European um, uh, theater, um, and many Lombard cities accepted his lordship as we recognized, and that was for the sake of protection. Right? Late, much later in 1396, Genoa surrendered to, to Charles the, the Sixth of France, s seeking protection from Gian Galeazzo Visconti, Duke of Milan, that at this point had expanded massively in a in, uh, great part of northern and central Italy. Um, it's meaningful how you can spot the kind of politically weak power on the base of these interventions, right? Milan would have not needed this. 
at this point because it was just kind of a kingdom on its own. Um, and the, the, word, the, the ones who aggressed and that were now trying to be countered by foreign powers, but also um, there was a very deep connection that started happening b exactly at this point between Milan and France that would be very important also for future history because that's through this dynastic ties that the French would claim eventually with uh, Charles VIII and so on. Uh, the uh, inheritance of the Neapolitan kingdom and of the Milanese duchy and not just, for example, Naples that they uh, when was conquered by the Aragonese, they said, oh, wait a second, that was Angevin, it was French, it was our dynasty. I mean, the Angevins, you know, they were basically just a branch of the Capetians. Um, in fact, the marriage we're talking about, famously enough, is the one agreed on April the 8th, 1387, between Louis, Duke of Orléans, and Valentina, Gian Galeazzo's daughter, Valentina Visconti, um, and who was uh, Gian Galeazzo's heiress, as a matter of fact. And she brought, um, as part of the dowry, the entire city of Asti. It was a major banking center in Piedmont, by the way. That gives you the scale of, of royal nature here involved between the, the Valois and the Visconti. Uh, and naturally the Valois acquired at that point the, the prospect of the Visconti inheritance at the same time as we were saying before. Uh, there were also other attritions in a bit more peripheral area. Uh, we're specifically talking about Venice and its interests in the Adriatic Sea that brought her in conflict with Hungary over Dalmatia that, as you know, was a um, battle over. Think about the Fourth Crusade. Here in, in the 40s of the 14th century, the Venetians managed to take Zara, and in 1350s, that is Zada, right? Um, in, in, in 1357, the Hungarian armies, however, again overran Dalmatia, forcing the Venetian Republic to surrender its territories, including the same Zadar, Saint Zara, and the Doge also to renounce his ancient title of Duke of Dalmatia. That was very old. Uh, this happened in 1358. Uh, later, Hungary also interfered by joining the the anti-Venetian coalitions in the blockade um, of Venice by the Genoese in the War of Chioggia, fought between 1378 and 1381. This was the consistently the only moment in which Venice risked to be uh, overwhelmed. Why? Because it was being fought by another maritime power, like all these other powers basically continental Europe didn't have, that is Genoa. Genoa basically blocked Venice after having ambushed and destroyed her fleet in, um, in Istria. Um, and uh, there was all um, uh, the they, they blockaded Chioggia that is basically at the you know it's close to Venice and the Venetians managed through greater political cohesion technical skill technological skill as well to overrun the Genoese and to force uh, and to 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 uh, force them to abort the the attack in fact Venice kind of lost at war but at the same time it surpassed the Gen the Ligurian uh, rival in um, in in power and prestige because they, they were two very different systems and uh, Genoa was simply m much less of a state than Venice was aside from the sheer number of possessions that Venice had more in uh, we made videos about this the, about the the balance between the Italian maritime republics it's very important to stress because here Genoa yes maintains certain strongholds in the eastern Mediterranean Black Sea but uh, fundamentally is obliged by the alliance between Venice and the Aragonese to open the, the Atlantic route. And that would be also very important for the age of explorations because, you know, think about the canneries, think about all these made in the 14th century some important geographical discoveries. Well, those were fundamentally um, yeah, I mean, it was mostly under Iberian monarchies, but the crews and the ships were all Italian. Um, obviously. Um, but um, still, speaking of Hungary, there were saying before, in, in this occasion um, of the War of Chioggia, finally, Venice was forced to cede some 
territory in Istria and even mainland Italy to Hungary. Right, it wasn't dramatic, but still, it's worth to notice. In 1391, and there was also an attempt to check the Lord of Milan, which was but the obsession of uh, you know all the anti-Milanese powers. They were freaking out. The, the Visconti were about to literally unify the world central northern Italy at some point. Um, they didn't have a you know aside from Lombardy much of a tight grip on the strategies, and that's why just dynastic crises were enough to make you know crum the thing crumble. But objectively, they had the the capacity of doing that. Uh, Florence especially was freaking out so much that they enlisted John III, the Count of Armagnac. The Armagnac had participated also to to the aborted, uh, to the failed siege, papal siege of Ferrara back in the 30s. Um, so you find these French uh, lineages that are involved here and there. As in, they, they enlisted against Milan and Armagnac was uh, Armagnac army was defeated and the same nobleman uh, was killed at Alexandria on July the um, 25th 1391 by the Milanese army right the Milanese army at this point actually takes a, an interesting set of blows right even Charles IV tried to 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 do it they, the Milanese start controlling you know that they, they control essentially north um, western uh, they control the, the western Alps so they um, they can literally blockade certain important passes and so on. And there are this uh, hard kernel that, that resists to do it because they're the most structured of the Italian powers from a political and military point of view. They're a true military, uh, expansionistic, aggressive scenery that has a lot of state building going on. It has, in fact, the most advanced administrative um, system in, in Italy. And in... Um, Equally, in 1401, uh, Robert of Bavaria entered Italy, once again in Florentine pay, and was defeated by the Visconti at Brescia on October the 24th. So, the Visconti powered these important blows, but you understand what's the point here. It's, th it's Florentine money that, that fuels these expeditions. There is no major expansionistic capacity of other powers. Uh, but capacity, but also will, of course, uh, to to set foot in Italy on a firm, on a stable scale. Uh, Armagnac's and Robert of Bavaria's uh, justifications for these interference was mm, the representation of Gian Galeazzo Visconti as an usurper, and this is. Uh, you know, it, it's a complex topic because it has to do also with the rise of the condottieri and the fact that the Italian nobility was mostly recent, or at least it wasn't like, uh, you know, these were stately powers of, of, of royal scale, right? And they had armies that countered ones of kings, but they weren't kings themselves by blood. So they were actually seeking for recognition. Great part of the connection with especially the empire was important for these seniors to obtain a feudal legitimacy for their power. It was true for the Este, for the, the La Scala, etc. Um, and at, at the same time, what we find in Italy at this point is the important flow of foreign soldiers, as we were remembering before. Initially, there was this major German wave. Then it was the time of the Bretons, of the Hungers, uh, of the English, that actually will be, in, uh, in, pro you know, in relative terms, the most successful because of the of the advanced English military system at the time uh, think about you know what happened after the Treaty of Bretigny where all these uh, hundred years of veterans um, poured in in Italy this happened in 1360 so in, you find in 1361 the Marquis of Montferrat hiring the White Company at the time of Albert Stairs um, made up of various nationalities telling the truth but they did, were all veterans of the wars in France The, the the here it's also a fascinating topic because um, there is a bit the impression and the stereotype that that Italians were kind of less warlike than than other peoples at the time. If you look at what was happening in the peninsula, you you're surprised how this thing could have come about. Um, 
it was mostly the, the you know, a, a sum of prejudices, you know, the fact that the Italians, the Lombards, as they were called, probably were more merchants than knights, this thing of that they weren't actually nobility of blood, uh, the stereotype of the evil Lombard in, in the Carolingian, uh, you know, um, epics and all this stuff. Um, but as a matter of fact, if you, if, when you look at weird sources of that time, even foreign, you find important individuals, even from England, or, you know, errors that surely weren't to be taught the military art by anybody, that, you know, these Italian lords were fundamentally quite warlike. Actually, there was, a, they all exercised arms, almost all of them actually exercised arms. It was an important, the Italians were the ones that actually developed the, the, the tournaments proper at this time. I mean, the, the thing of the fancy middle, the, the it's all an Italian thing that eventually spreads somewhere. I mean, and there is an important military culture there. The, the point is that Italy is fragmented, right? It doesn't have properly a kingdom there to frame military structures, etc. Actually, the Milanese, the Venetians, accomplish a lot, especially in the 15th century. But all the word likeness of these air, it is actually high, doesn't find an actual frame to be profitably, you know, because it's all separated, it's all divided. As we've seen, these were all small cities, I mean, actually big cities, but, you know, small territory, you know, um, provincial scale, a few tens of miles that managed to reach kind of a, a regional dimension. It's a, It was already a big deal, but that is far from, you know, having an entire kingdom like other countries had. As we were saying, the Milanese maybe could have achieved that, but uh, there weren't the, you know, the the premises for that. Italy hadn't been a kingdom like that. The South, Naples, was like that, for example. But also in there, the power of barons was taking over. But if you p pick, for example, the Papal States, the Papal States had perhaps the, the finest uh, mil uh, military men, the finest condottieri in the world, Italy. They were some of the most warlike families of, of uh, throughout all the 14th, 15th centuries, an astonishing uh, level of professionalism and military activity. Well, the Papal State was freaking a mess, right? It was all fragmented. During the 14th century, the, 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 the popes with Albornoz uh, tried to bring back all the central Italian lands under the, the Papal control to build something more stately, but at the end of the day, it's a sum of important... Uh, Signories even in there, like the Montefeltro, for example, and it's there, there's not a unitary pattern there that can channel these troops into a more, you know, structured command. This is actually the truth for most of Europe at this time, because if, if you accept the English that that are, you know, you pick mostly the, the Western monarchies that were the most important. I mean, it, it's fundamentally England, France, and Castile, but the rest of Europe doesn't have much of a kind of professional system that is heading towards like a permanent, um, at least, you know, maybe not the cutters, but the, 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 the caters, but the general, you know, idea that you have to have these troops in arms. I mean, the, the French uh, are in the mid 14th century, just the, the first ones who basically stop disbanding armies even just by chance um, and therefore they have tech they start technically having something similar to a permanent army right here the, the, the whole thing is different the, the condottieri here have to be studied carefully because they obviously reflect the peculiar Italian political and social situation that has nothing to do with more being more or less warlike than other areas but actually with just the in fact, the, the Clausewitz and idea of what do you have to do with these, right? Towards the 70th or the 14th century, by the way, uh, the condottieris uh, become altogether Italians, once again, right? Uh, throughout the, the, all these first years, the decades, they, they had been fundamentally all overwhelmingly foreign. There had always been Italians then, but these uh, groups had, had constituted the majority. From the 70s, the 80s, it's all Italians. That's also another, uh, honestly, I don't know why. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, understandably, there is, um, you know, that has to do with the stabilization also of, of local powers. There is the idea that they can draw resources from a more local base, etc. So that makes sense, but it, it's very sudden. And that's interesting to, would be interesting to deepen at a level. But as we were saying before, and still speaking of foreign mercenaries, uh, definitely the greatest, you know, Frame, fame of fortune was acquired by uh, as a condottiere by the Englishman Sir John Hawkwood. 
died 1394. That was a hell was a hell of a of a fighter and a soldier. Um, he won the the prestige. I mean, if you go into Dome of Florence, you have this magnificent depiction of his um, as a funeral monument. Uh, even though he had actually fought against Florence, I mean, these men started to be considered as, you know, the really important military instruments. The English were good because they had, through the indenture system, this best form of professional organization throughout Europe at this time, hence the great English victories during, during the Hundred Years' War. Um, the English introduced the longbow in Italy. Not that longbow did not exist there, but it was in war. It was not uh, used, right? They used crossbows. And the interesting thing is that the English use it with some success in Italy. Not astonishing, also because of course they're not the entire English army. They, they we don't have a an actual, you know, term of comparison in here, unfortunately. As it is true. Um, in fact, uh, this is exactly the point. Uh, Italy being fragmented and also relatively isolated doesn't... There's not like the Italian army versus the French army or things like that. I mean, yeah, maybe with the French and Italians it happens, but even in there it's not like the full French royal army, right? It was the expedition of Philip of Valois in, the, in 1320. Uh, but that was ill-fated because it was the, completely disorganized. The Milanese arrived, this was an enormous army. Uh, the French basically, you know, greets and says, "Ah, you know, I go away." <laughs> That's how it happened. Um, but uh, there is no compare. Even think about the, you know, Henry VII's army. Right? There is no major pitch battle there happening. The Italians actually fight a lot of pitch battles against their own, probably more than any other people out there at the time, um, except maybe for France, given the Hundred Years' War. But um, Again, it's basically the same armies, the same people, right? So it's it's difficult to make a comparison with other realities. It's um, that's an interesting field of study. But it's meaningful that after that, uh, the 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 white company, the, the English uh, mercenaries go away from Italy. Nobody used longbows in Italy. They keep using crossbows. Right, and that's also another issue of what's best, you know, the longbow and the crossbow. It's a, it's it's a question that doesn't make sense, tactically speaking. Uh, if we want to make it in term of performance, uh, I can quote you a, an important amount of scholarship that actually says that crossbow was was actually superior. Don't come to tell me the the you know the the, the rate of fire, the rate the altogether considered crossbow was superior, and there is even evidence of crossbows in Italy by in the 40s of the 14th century to actually stop cavalry charges um, not very differently actually but and actually preventing them like like in the hundred years war um, so we're talking about large numbers in here consider that the long bowmen were usually more uh, or at least they in, in, in proportion with men at arms were were more uh, in English armies. In the Italian ones they were more balanced kind of but th that also reveals that the crossbow was kind of more you know these crossbowmen were some more effective. Don't quote me Chrissy, because we don't even technically know what happened there and it's not that if for once that you know the, the Genoese fought against the, the English uh, you can say well that's the proof of uh, we don't we simply don't have enough uh, evidence on that level and it's unfortunate right uh, sure is the French kept using French uh, Genoese crossbowmen, right? So even if they had been useless, evidently they would stop using them. And basically, all Europe kept when you know with going on with crossbows. So there is a point there that it's not the the weapon or the technology as always, but the doctrine that counts. Remember always that technology without doctrine is zero, right? Technology doesn't find an adequate field of application, doesn't serve to anything, right? Um, um, it would be interesting to digress on on the of the mercenaries um, and the companies that took over uh, in certain cases in Italy and here, but it's um, a wholly different topic. Maybe we'll see on another occasion. We'll make many videos about that. But the point being that these armies were there, as we were saying at the beginning, because actually they were called and they were paid by someone, 
right? It wasn't just a random motor gear that arrived there uh, without any support breaking through these powers. These powers didn't have much, for example, of an interest to stop them just to cross their country. On the contrary, said, pass, because we don't want problems here. Um, these companies weren't much of a, a threat even for the local military in the sense that, you know, it was enough just to shut your own city gates and these guys would maybe ravage the countryside but then would pass by. Uh, this is the case of the first of the great company of the uh, Dove company, the, the first one, the Germans. But, uh, they don't make a great impression, right? They were surely great fighters, they were hungry, they were kind of disadapted to the situation that you get the impression of that, that is, uh, leaving aside a psychologistic interpretation of like, uh, this might have really literally have had post-traumatic stress disorder, there were people who were exposed, we know it, because Italian chronicles are full of this, that there was unspeakable violence carried out by these people, that actually was, was carried out by the same Italians at the same level, but the Italians were impressed by this, and a bit stereotypically they stressed, ah, these barbarians and so on, uh, but if you look at the actual military successes of these units, it was when they were framed in, in in larger armies, right? The German cavalry, for example, was the spearhead of the Italian armies at this point, but the rest of the army was Italian and uh, there was a tactical interaction between these. They weren't, weren't just cavalry armies. Crossbows, uh, crossbowmen were usually Italian, there was the stopping infantry. Um, the, there are interesting, you know, the major assets, even artillery naturally starts appearing here. Italy's on the lead, together with Egypt, for example, with explosive, um, with uh, especially naval warfare at that level, actually. But mm, these are some of the most advanced areas in, in the West. Uh, so, whatever happening here, if you see all these mercenaries pouring, it's not much of a case of aggression, but simply a a job market and that's how it practically worked and uh, the Italians were quite unprejudiced about this I mean as as long as these guys fought they, they were fine and they had the Italians had money to pay that's also another reason why they they preferred to make these guys fight in their stead um, because it was more convenient not just because you might have been just an average middle-class citizen that didn't, didn't give a damn about war and risking your life because you you had enough wealth to not to want to die but uh, also lords used mercenaries to kind of disarm the middle classes that by the way were also quite violent on their own telling the truth they, there are interesting episodes of violence um, life in communal Italy was pretty harsh but surely here there is a compaction also of, of authority there is the idea that there's a more vertical, more oligarchic society taking over. And the mid-14th century crisis is naturally weakens the middle and lower classes' powers. And, and that's how the seigneuries, broadly speaking, rise. Even when you find popular um, regimes, it's actually popular in the sense of um, it was a joint, like there were, I don't know, the oligarchic mercantile families ruling jointly. Not a, not a, um, a tyranny, as they called it. With a with a lord, uh, th th that was otherwise appreciated in other centers, and uh, even in terms of political culture by certain certain cities, it's always a brutal passage, actually, in a way or another. But that makes you understand it wasn't much of a choice either. In fact, uh, speaking of. Um, Imperial ambitions were recorded before how Ludwig the Bavarian was uh, he was a fascinating figure he he played it cleverly with Milan with Lucca he seized his crown in Rome and came back to Germany quite smooth in a sense the end was a bit of a disaster yes because the army simply melted away but he had he had arrived to the Alps so that was the point he had accomplished his goal um, Charles the Fourth, that is definitely a clever guy, was more what much more skillful and pragmatic, right? He knew Italy probably better than than what Henry the Seventh looked the Bavarian had done, even even his father had done. And he used mostly his imperial office to sell privileges, assuredly exploiting political divisions, to make you know, not massive, but uh, meaningful territorial gains, even if in the short term, for example, 
before ascending to the throne, he he supported the anti de la Scala alliance, which brought to him Belluna and Feltre in northeastern Italy. Uh, this lasted between 1337 and 1358. Uh, it was clever to do. Uh, these are small centers, but they're important uh, on the alpine foothills from a strategic point of view. Uh, papal ambitions, as we were saying before, um, kind of failed in a sense. Um, under John the Twenty Second, all the the effort of creating a uh, papal seigniory in, in the mid Po Valley failed, and an enormous amount of money was spent. Even in here, all the army was mostly German mercenaries, uh, cavalry, because the Germans were cavalry, right? You know, that, that's the, of course they had the infantry or crossbows, but we're talking here about even the affirmation of the barbuta over the simple milas, right? Um, the idea that there is also technical, tactical. Um, even administrative um, evolution, the idea that the Barbuta, for example, is a tactical unit with not just the knight and the squire, but also crossbowmen attached, uh, I mean, a mounted crossbowmen. Uh, and um, eventually, by the 60s of the 14th century, the English bring the new term of the Lanx as a, as a standard that will remain the Lancia in Italian also later on during the, the 15th century, in the golden age of the Italian condottieri. So um, this is worth mentioning because it makes you realize that war also took an ever more structural weight and that required naturally states to structure themselves in accordingly. Um, we could quote a lot of other political games here and there, like the, the, the grandiose idea encouraged by Gian Galeazzo is continue to end the schism, this great schism in the West, to establish uh, a French kingdom in the Papal States that failed because you know, there was no room for it in the, in the first place. Or, for example, the um, Florentine French alliance in 1396 to divide up the Visconti domina uh, the, yeah, dominions, which also kind of didn't have much of a success. Uh, the French rule in Genoa ended in 1409 because of turmoils. Um, the Hungarian gains at the expense of Venice we are talking about before were actually reversed by 1420. So what is that we can't say in conclusion to this picture? Well, in my opinion, it's pretty evident. And when you study the sources from the actual, you know, bottom to top, let's say, you realize that... Yes, uh, Italy was a bit of, has always been a paradox, right? It, it, it's, it was isolated in a sense, because as we've seen, there was properly no power here that could f set its foot there and create something else, right? This is true for, for Italy in its many dominations. It's not that uh, a, a power arrived, replaced the people who were there, ruled with iron fist. It was always about an oligarch, you know, a, a, um, a conqueror that was eventually, you know, obliged to cope with the local elites and eventually to melt with them. Um, not even so much, because these elites were so advanced in times that it was just like a dynastic invitation, right, you know. And this is evident in many cases, especially in communal Italy, where literally that foreign element properly wasn't there. It's not until the, the wars of Italy that you find properly a, a Spanish-dominated, or a French or a Spanish-dominated Lombardy, for example. Um, but other powers could be under the Spanish influence or French influence, but they still were technically autonomous, right? And they would always remain like that. Why? Because these lands were overpopulated, were uh, over uh, wealthy, let's say. So you couldn't simply eradicate these this elites. But at the same time, you could interfere with them profitably. So that that's the kind of negotiation. If you wonder where humanism also comes from, and the Renaissance comes from, it's this deep, it's this political subtlety that was was not just about having a massive kingdom where you have that established rule and then you have just to strengthen it and that's the game, right? That is also bringing a lot of civilization elsewhere. But here it's acting more subtly and on an ever more continental scale. That is, Italy, yes, is basically left in, in during this 14th century. Nobody manages to enter there and remain. But at the same time, it's ever more dependent on foreign countries. Um, 
especially because of the competition between the same Italians. There is no major hegemonic power that man man manages to, to take over here and there. We made more than one video about the policy of the equilibrium that at the end of the day was a failure, but it lasted for basically for, for 40 years in, in the second half of the, four, uh, the 15th century with some, you know, some success, um, I'd say, um, before, however, showing that there was an evident political crisis that for which at the end of Lorenzo de Medici this thing uh, was was crumpled uh, uh, mercilessly, let's say, under the, the pressure, however, now of much more advanced states than the one the Middle Ages had seen, because late 15th century France or Spain, well, now we're a thing, right? Um, and it's different times. The 14th centuries were more messy, I would say. So this is a bit the conclusion of it, and this is just like a an introduction to the period. And it's obvious that we should point out a lot of things, but it, it's it's important to see also towards the end of the 14th century that there is less permeability, right? There are bigger plans if you want, but less achievements, right? Whereas early 14th century Italy looked a bit more like the 31 with the expeditions of the Germans, etc. A, a bit as a r uh, established ritual. The, the 14th century is also the one in which the, with Ludwig the Bavarians decided that imperial crowning is also ba basically a German business, so that Italy is not so necessary for the crowning. That is a uh, that never, you know, that connection never comes less because it will remain up to late in time. But still, it's the also the representing the withdrawal of certain important powers. Here, everybody loses technically. Um, except the Italians, because the Neapolitans contract go downhill. The papacy contracts too. Uh, the empire contracts too. France contracts to the 14th century's massive crisis under this point. Of view. So it's obvious that for these powers to, to bloom, right, and to, to establish what instead, by the end of the Middle Ages, way more compact political realities, as we were saying before, managed to take over this um, more, more incoherent, um, uh, let's say, but again, there are 200 years of difference in here. But there is this, still the same pattern, in, in a way, reappearing. So this history is not easy. I, I promise that we will talk more in, in detail about these things at some point. Probably it's going to be for military reasons, because the even the uh, level of depth that I started since January you know, I surpassed certain manualistic content again, a bit into, yeah, I mean, other manualistic content, but a bit more, you know, in-depth, much larger information, also more detailed at this local level in all the various areas of Europe. So, but as far as the military is concerned, this, um, the, there, there is way more to know, and if you are interested in these topics, there is, I don't know how much there is actually in, um, I presume in other languages in translation, but um, but if you read French or Italian or you know even there are some in good English texts about this stuff. Um, Mallet is a good read, for example, about the the Mercer. is a bit outdated and he doesn't quote sources quite uh, properly, I'd say. But he was a great he was a great scholar and he says very fascinating things about this. Right, so that just for an introduction, by the way, but. It's. I would give you this this advice with history because it's a problem that I face basically every day. Never think history stops to what is already being said, right? Not because you can't get rid of what is always already being said, but bec because properly, history at a certain point gets to its, uh, such a level of complexity that it's virtually impossible to put a definitive, the definitive word end to certain. Realities, even for the Middle Ages, even when you actually go in the archive and you you exhaust apparently a certain so it, it's co so much connected to lots of other things that you can hardly do without a, a revision. And, and naturally, history, you know, historiography is not sclerotic. Um, you know, people look at the past for reasons that are 
meaningful in, for the wrong time. So even when you think you have exo it's probably the moment when you f when you think you have exhausted a certain a certain picture that probably um, you it's the moment to go back look at it again. And in, in this specific case, and as well as most of 14th century history, it's plenty still of, of research to do. But I mean plenty, like we need other 100 <laughs> researchers to study these things, because, or even more, honestly, because we here also the level of documentation starts to be really massive. Right up to the 13th century, there's a, you know, non-stressful balance, even for maybe the beginning of the 14th there. But from that time on, you, you start having so much that you even wonder, you know, how the hell do I study this period? And the 14th century is a mess. As I was uh, saying at the, the beginning of the video, like, I, I, for example, I didn't like the 14th century, and I got <laughs> to make a, a PhD on it. And it was absurd, also because I didn't have much of a background. Um, but when you get acquainted with due time patience for years in this case, with you, you start realizing that it's not a mess, and that's also what research helps to. Because I also had read books about the 14th century before, but objectively I hadn't understood anything. Instead, it's important to to research, but also to find a path, a path, a pattern interpretation that sometimes even the uh, let's say the the most sophisticated historiography today skips, because in part there are naturally books that have already said simpler, easier things before, so you can go look at that for a general brainstorming. But at the same time, we, we're losing a bit of the omnicomprehensive perspective, right? And especially about these realities here, um, it's difficult to get a unitary view, because there was no unity. So it, that's where a great capacity of synthesis is required, and this areas amazes you, right, amaze you, because they, you wouldn't expect certain things to be there, mostly because we've never been told, mostly because nor historiography nor popular culture had dwelled so much into it, and and this has generated certain mistakes, um, mainly of perspective, but not less meaningful in this sense, because at the end of the day, history is a perspective, right, it's not the truth. Um, but, uh, you know, think about it. Alright, so, I hope for now that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise do a like or sus subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me, I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye.